Hi everybody, welcome to My Favorite Mistake. I'm Mark Graben. My guest today, another Mark, he is Mark Pett, and he is the author of a, a book that I was really happy to find. Um, it's called The Girl Who Never Made Mistakes. And so before I introduce Mark uh, a little bit more detail, thank you for being here as a, a guest on the podcast. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for having me. So Mark is a writer and an illustrator. Uh, he makes books. He calls himself an author straighter. So that tells you he's got um, multiple skill sets that he's bringing to these books. The books are I'm Not Millie, This Is My Book, Lizard from the Park, The Boy in the Airplane, The Girl in the Bicycle, and The Girl Who Never Made Mistakes. Uh, before books, he created the syndicated comic strips, Mr. Lowe and Lucky Cow. So Mark, um, we're going to we're going to call you in advance um, the, the guest who never made mistakes. I, that is definitely not the case. Okay, well, that's fine. You're in the right place. I am, I am the host who makes mistakes all the time. So <laughs> that's all right. Um, so, you know, before we, we talk about the book and, um, you know, it's really, it's, it's a delightful uh, book, The Girl Who Never Made Mistakes. We're going to start off first, as we usually do here on the podcast, Mark. What would you say is your favorite mistake professionally? Uh, so uh, this is a story that goes back to early on in my career. So my first job out of college was as a political cartoonist in Prague, of all places in the Czech Republic. And uh, I just happened upon the job. And then I... I tried to get started in political cartooning in the United States after that, uh, a few years after. And this was back in the 90s. Um, you know, Bill Clinton was president. Uh, you know, so lots, you could imagine the kinds of editorial cartoons we were doing <laughs> back in those days. Uh, and I had always had this idea that I wanted to be this, like, young phenom, this great cartoonist, uh, you know, who was, so I studied in order to, to do that. I studied all of the, uh, the great political cartoonists of the time, uh, Jeff McNally, Pat Oliphant, Jim Boardman, uh, which were, these were all really great editorial cartoonists back yeah. in the nineties. And, uh, I even submitted my work at one point. I was only, I was just doing freelance political cartoons at the time for various publications, including a weekly, you know, just an alternative weekly. And I submitted them uh, in my, in my brashness, submitted them for the Pulitzer Prize. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, they released the finalists for the Pulitzer. And lo and behold, uh, one of the finalists was Pet. That's my last name. Is Pet, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, another guy who was exactly my age, named Steve Breen. And it turned out the Pet they were referring to was not me. I got all excited, but it was. It turned out there was another political cartoonist named Pet, uh, who mm -hmm. worked for the Lexington Herald Leader, Joel Pet. And anyway, so. Uh, that was, you know, dejecting. And meanwhile, this guy, Steve Breen, who was my age, exactly, won the Pulitzer Prize. And I was so jealous uh, of this guy, Steve. Uh, so anyway, I start thinking, if I'm going to be a political cartoonist, I have to be a staff cartoonist at a newspaper, not a, a uh, freelancer as I was. So mm -hmm. I may, had an objective of of sending out my portfolio far and wide to any newspaper in the country with a circulation over 50,000 uh, readers, which was uh, mm -hmm. uh, about 200 newspapers at that time. So I sent out my portfolio far and wide, and I got a, a, uh, just a slew of rejections uh, from that. Um, but I got one letter in particular. And it came from, lo and behold, it came from Steve Breen, the guy that had won the Pulitzer, who was my exact age. And he gave me, it was a very nice letter, he gave me some advice. But then he also pointed out that in my admiration of these cartoonists uh, of 
Jeff McNelly and Jim Borgman and Pat Oliphant, I had not just uh, been influenced by them, but I was borrowing some of their ideas, uh, uh -oh. you might say generously. Uh -oh. And he even pointed out, uh, and I'm going to hold up a piece of paper for those who are watching a video, I found the letter that Steve Breen wrote to me back, back then. And he showed me a cartoon that I had done. This was a cartoon that I had done. And then he pointed out these similarities to a cartoon that uh, oh. Jim Borgman had done. And you can see that I had pretty much plagiarized Jim Borgman. I mean, it's a different uh, joke, but it was, I mean, it was, he was calling me out uh. on uh, borrowing extremely heavily from these cartoonists that I was influenced wow. by. And when I received that letter from him, I was mortified. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it was from this guy who I was so already had like uh, uh, envy about mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he had achieved the kind of status that I had wanted to have at that time. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to crawl into a hole. I felt so embarrassed uh, right. that someone had noticed. And I realized as I looked back at my cartoons, I mean, that was an egregious example, mm -hmm. but I was in my desire for uh, greatness, you might say, I was clearly trying to be something uh, I was not. And I was clearly trying to uh, yeah, I, I was clearly cheating at it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I decided to use that, op that, that letter as a real look in the mirror at mm, the right. approach that I was taking to my work and to my art. And it turned out to be a real gift to me mm -hmm. uh, that he had done. By writing that letter and pointing it out to me and he'd yeah. done it very nicely he did not do it in a you know he didn't rub my nose in it or you know um, right but it was I, it turned out to be such a gift for me and uh, I used that to to start working on my own style and on my own right. really kind of uh, taking a more organic approach to my work has paid off in dividends. In the end, I actually ended up running into Steve Breen at a... I, I was going to ask if you ever talked to him again. Yeah. I ran into him at a cartoonist convention uh, years and years later, and I, I went up to him. I don't think he even remembered the writing the letter, but I went up to him and reminded him of it and thanked him for doing that for me. Uh, yeah, because it was such a gift at the time. But it was at the, when it happened, it was just mortifying. And fortunately for me, it was never, you know, this, that could be a career killer. Uh, you know, if it had happened perhaps today, yeah. you know, it could really. Wow. But, uh, I, when, when you were telling that story, you used the word gift. But I was thinking of, you know, the expression, uh, you know, feedback is a gift. And, you know, that feedback doesn't, you know, it might not always feel like a great gift, but, you know, you, you can think back and I mean, what would have happened if he hadn't sent that letter? Mm -hmm. You know, how many other people might have noticed the similarity in the work and then didn't say anything? And, you know, and, and then yeah. you, you know, and, and what that might have led to. So um, it's, it's really interesting that you do view that as a gift, that that was an opportunity to course correct. Well, I had a choice at the time. I could have used it and uh, I, I could have denied it, you know, uh, as we often do when faced with our, our, our less attractive parts mm -hmm. of ourselves, you know, our, our, our shadier sides. We can deny it. I could have crawled in a hole. I could have, like, never drawn a cartoon again. But uh, I made a choice at that time to view it as a yeah. gift and as an opportunity to really examine myself yeah. and what I was yeah, doing. Cause, cause, 
and I'm glad I did. Well, I'm, I, and I'm glad you shared that story. I mean, because you, you're, you're right. I mean, looking, having looked at the picture and seeing two Bill Clintons, you, you could have rationalized and said, well, look, Bill Clinton has a certain number of features. There was his nose and he was a little you know, hefty at times. And well, you, you could say, well, I just exaggerated the obvious things and some other cartoonists exaggerated the same thing. But those drawings were pretty similar. Yeah, in a, in a, they yeah, were really yeah. similar. And uh, <laughs> and I when I looked through my portfolio, I realized there were other examples mm -hmm. as well uh, where I had had been influenced very generously by by other cartoonists and uh, and I'm pleased to say I've, it, it has affected the way I've done my work I think uh, I find myself now at the time I had a lot of envy for other mm -hmm. cartoonists who were having more success than I was having and and nowadays I don't feel that same kind of envy. I feel a kind of joy when I read something or see something really great that another author or illustrator or cartoonist hmm. has done. And I think it's because I don't, I don't tie my success to, uh, what others think of my mm -hmm. work necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I'm an author, it's about communication. So it does matter how my work is, uh, reaches other people, but I don't view it in the same, in the same way. It's not about winning Pulitzer mm -hmm. prizes, uh, so much as it is about reaching readers. So, so then as you continue with your work, um, did, did you try to, you know, sort of try not to take in as much work of others. Cause I, I think of, you know, somebody, uh, you know, there, there, there are times where like, you know, unsub, uh, unsolicited manuscripts will get rejected or like, you know, creative say, well, I, I don't want to even look at it because even if I inadvertently am influenced by it, I don't want to be sued. I mean, do you try to limit exposure or. Uh, so at, at first I limited myself to a lot of different uh, published work as well as unpublished work, just because I needed a, some yeah. space to to figure out what I was about, and what mm. I was trying to communicate, and what style I was going to do that in. So at first, I did just kind of shut myself off from a lot of different stuff. Uh, I don't do that mm. anymore. I find inspiration in other people's work, but not in a not in the same way that I would have found inspiration uh, yeah. back then. I think uh, it's a different kind. It's more of a joy mm -hmm. of, of creation. Um, however, if someone were to send me, I'm, I'm somewhat loath to look at unpublished stuff for the reason mm -hmm. you suggest that um, because uh, it happens all the time that we get influenced mm -hmm. by other ideas. And if, uh, if I were to do something very similar to someone's unpublished work, uh, yeah. that could be yeah. a problem. So. But, and do you feel like at this point, I mean, this is 20 some years later, you've developed a style and you feel more com uh, confident in that style where it's, it's yeah. more uh, defined than it, it might've been earlier in your career when you were trying to find your voice as an artist or as a writer, a creative. I think the best thing I ever did was to do a daily syndicated comic mm -hmm. strip because, uh, in doing that, and I did that for s about six or seven years. Uh, and that was my proverbial 10,000 hours, you know, that, uh, uh, was it Malcolm Gladwell, I think suggested mm -hmm. that, in order to really master something, you need to do it for 10,000 hours. And when you have to produce uh, a published piece of work every single day yeah. of the year uh, with no vacation yeah. for six or seven years, that uh, it, it forces you to find your mm -hmm. way. You know, you invariably it also enforces you to address your own issues of perfectionism which it turned out that was really what was uh, interesting at play as well was my own 
desire for greatness was rooted in this idea that I needed to be uh, some very scrubbed and polished version of myself that wasn't even a version of myself. It was uh, just an image I was trying yeah. to to create. The and so when in doing a comic strip every single day for seven years, it forced me to let go of that idea of perfectionism because when you do it that often, you're going to produce a lot of mediocre work, <laughs> you know, and it's inevitable. It's really, uh, it just comes with the territory. And so you have to start viewing it like baseball where you're <laughs> trying to have a good batting mm -hmm. average. You know, you're not going to hit a home run every time. You're just trying to like, <laughs> produce a decent body of work for that mm. period of time. And that was, that was a hard thing to wow. reckon with personally. And, and it also in time, I found that my style emerged and my voice emerged and my, um, and all sorts of things happened very slowly in imperceptible ways. Uh, Interesting. And at the end, I felt like I knew who I was creatively, which has then allowed me to go into books and do something that, uh, you know, uh, with a, with a voice that felt much more mm -hmm. authentic and true to who I yeah. was. So when you, you bring up the theme of perfectionism, um, or the illusion or image of that, I mean, you know, that, that's one reason the girl who never made mistakes, resonated with me. I think I was uh, a perfectionist as a kid. I try to be a recovering perfectionist as an adult. And the irony is like, I'm a sloppy perfectionist. So right, I make yeah. that perfectionism doesn't lead to sometimes um, being overly cautious. It just leads to me being hard on myself about the mistakes I do make. Yeah. So, um, but I, I want to hear your story uh, behind, you know, the, the inspiration to write The Girl Who Never Made Mistakes? Well, this was the first book I did. And there's, uh, as a, my first children's book mm -hmm. that I that I wrote and illustrated was this, and I co-wrote it with a friend of mine, um, Gary Rubenstein. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a reason it was the first one, because uh, I wrote it when I first had a child of my own, and I was reading a lot of books to my kids, and and uh, I realized, wait a minute, these these picture books, these are basically really long Sunday comic mm -hmm. strips, you know, like the Sunday comics are always a little longer than the daily comics and in color yeah. and stuff. And these picture books just feel like long Sunday comic strips. I could do this. I've been doing it for years. So um, that's what what motivated mm -hmm. me. And I wanted to do something, and I and I thought about what's the kind of book that would have resonated with me as a kid and a book about perfectionism struck me but but one that wasn't one that also indulged the fantasy mm -hmm. of perfectionism which is that you never make a mistake that you're always perfect right and I see kids, I see a lot of anxious kids in the world today, as I was mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. I was a kid, who uh, just are terrified of making mistakes or who, you know, when they draw something, it needs to be just right. It needs to be perfect. Uh, and I could relate to that. And so when the book opens, it, it opens to the fantasy mm -hmm. of perfectionism, which is this girl who is famous in her town because she's <laughs> never made a mistake. I mean, this is the fantasy of every perfectionist kid, right? That they're just, they're flawless and they're perfect and they never make a mistake and people recognize that and they, you know, laud them for it. Um, and so I liked, I wanted to start with that fantasy because... Uh, it was an acknowledgement. I've read criticism of that book, of this book, where it's like, that's, you know, you shouldn't open it that way because it makes it seem like perfectionism is a good thing. But I wanted to open it that way because uh, as a kid, that's the, that's the, you know, it's like, 
it's any kid who dreams of being Superman, you know, it's the mm -hmm. same kind of fantasy, you know, of being yeah. perfect. And, well, but uh, it, it tees up the book and yeah. the point you end up getting to, like, you know, she has fans and photographers and maybe it's not aggressive paparazzi, but yeah. 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 And then I wanted to deconstruct it from there, you know, just, uh, so as a kid, I think it's a book that I would have responded to. Um, and, uh, so I think that's why, that's why I wrote it that way and, 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 and illustrated it. And it's, I think that's the reason it was my first book was just cause it was one that I, I mean, as I observed, I was new to fatherhood at the time, but as I observed mm -hmm. parenting and helicopter parenting and, and, uh, uh, and was reflecting on the kind of parent I wanted to be, uh, this was what spoke to that was wanting to be the kind of father who celebrated my children, you know, uh, no matter who they were and that they wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted them to feel like they could try and explore and make mistakes and discover. Uh, yeah. 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 And it's, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I hope people will go and buy the book and read it and I won't give away spoilers of the cute story <laughs> along the way, but, um, you know, the way, the way it resolves with, the girl, Beatrice, you know, kind of becoming comfortable with the idea of we make mistakes, life goes on. She's yeah. still, her, her life is not defined by perfection or defined by her mistakes. Her family still loves her and people are still going to be friends with her at school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's this really, I, to me, you know, a really nice message from the book that way. Well, thank you. Thanks for the plug. And I'm so glad I'm reading it as an uh, reading it as an adult, um, you know, it, it, it made a little impact uh, on me. So I've, I've told a lot of other adults about the book. That's not your, your core audience, I'm sure, but it resonated. Think, yeah, with well, me. it, you know, it is, I think just as much. I mean, when I, I've, I've uh, gotten a lot of lovely letters from readers uh, who are adults who mm -hmm. appreciate it uh, probably more than their, child does even i think their child appreciates some of the humor in it you know but yeah. i think for the adults it speaks to this like inner child i guess who mm -hmm. with whom it really resonates so i appreciate that well i recently saw the uh, the tom hanks film about mr rogers and there's that reminder there you know mr rogers says we were all children once yeah <laughs> that child is still uh there in a way or influencing who we are as an adult. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a very, you know, um, you know, adult head, <clears throat> heady workplace concept of um, growth mindset. Um, Carol Dweck, who I'm, I'm hoping she's kind of, you know, she's on my dream list of guests um, here on the podcast of, you know, growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And, you know, to me, I guess my, my paraphrasing of it is, you know, fixed mindset says you have certain gifts. You either have them or you don't. You're either a great artist or like, I, I can't draw to save my life. I didn't put in 10,000 hours because that wouldn't probably lead to anything. Um, as opposed to growth mindset that says we can develop skills and we, we can grow and you don't have to be quote unquote born with it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what some of your thoughts are on this idea of, you know, kind of, you know, talent and what is there versus what we can develop. I'm thrilled to see this, uh, concept of growth mindset becoming, uh, a real theme in the business place, in schools. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of, I know a lot of teachers have been using this book, uh, the girl who never made mistakes to kick off their school year because they're really making mm. growth mindset a, a a theme and a focus in classrooms, which is really great to see because I think it begins with the adults. I think um, one of the 
more pernicious things about perfectionism is that it has a lot of s silent allies and adults who celebrate the kids who mm -hmm. are perfect, you know, who do things perfect. You in schools uh, back in my day, if you got a hundred on a test, sometimes you were they would change the seating order in a class <laughs> based on who yeah. got a hundred on a test. They would sit in the front of the class for everyone to see. You know, it was kind of you were celebrated for for perfectionism for or for for, for perfection, and uh, and I don't think that a lot of adults realize that the ways in which they kind of uh, give strength to perfectionism through mm -hmm. that kind of celebration of perfection. So mm -hmm. um, it's great to see a different idea taking root, this idea that uh, it's, it's about growth, not about some sort of uh, attainment or, or as you say, fit, you know, a fixed set of skills that you are kind of born with a talent or a, you know, uh, it's a shame to me. You know, I, I read somewhere that most adults can draw about as well as they could in fifth grade, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. because that's when they stop drawing. Uh, unless you were identified as a child of talent, you stop drawing when you're in fifth grade. And so you're, you have this kind of arrested development in your art skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's great to see uh, adult art classes taking root as well. You know, <laughs> ones with, whether you're drinking wine and painting or <laughs> yeah. whatever, or adult coloring books, uh, whatever. I mean, as a, as a, an artist myself, I like to see that. I think it's a shame that we don't do like, uh, have drawing continue as we do writing, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. into high school. And, mm -hmm. um, because I think it's, uh, it's, it's an important skill. It's an important skill to learn how to sketch. The sketch process is a process mm -hmm. of discovery and of trying things and seeing what you like and what you don't like, what works. And, uh, you know, and just in general, I think creating art is, uh, is antithetical to perfectionism really. Mm -hmm. uh, Although uh, that was where I kind of drifted in my own. Art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But one other question for you, Mark. I mean, I, I can think back. I'm drawing in my own memory, you know, back to elementary school. And, you know, there's always, you know, one kid or a couple of kids who are new, known as, like, the really talented drawing artists. Um, was, was, was that you? Or how much of that was um, talent versus interest and practice and development? Well... Uh, I'm gonna, I will say I'm, I, I was definitely known as an artist back then mm -hmm. when I was in grade school. Um, but I, looking back, I was an accomplished mimicker, I think. Like, again, mm -hmm. my art style just would drift radically. At the time, I was a big fan of Mad Magazine. And if you look mm -hmm. at my art style at the time, <laughs> uh, it would drift from there'd be one mad artist I would draw like, and then I would draw like another mad magazine artist for a while. And then I would draw like another one for a while. And I think I was just, it was my way of learning and there's nothing wrong with learning that way. But at the same time, I think it was, that was my way was this, this uh, was to mimic. I wasn't, I mean, along the way, I mean, I still came up with original ideas and, and had some good material along the way. But, uh, but yeah, I was known for that back then. I was also interestingly known as uh, a math scholar. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think I the thing I liked about math was that uh, you could be perfect in math. Like, mm. you could <laughs> there's a right answer. Perfect score on a math test. 
for getting yeah. all the right answers. And I like that. Uh, this one time I competed in a state math contest and I was thrilled. I got the only perfect score in the history of the competition. And that was my like crowning achievement. It was like I'd finally achieved perfectionism, you know, and uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I had a. But <laughs> there's no shoot. perfect score in art. There is no perfect score in art or life. Yeah. Uh, and I was just going to throw one other thing at you here, Mark, because you reminded me. So my, my art um, that I had more talent and drive for and accomplishment was music, uh, drums and percussion and where. Mm -hmm. And so there was um, something I ran, ran across years ago. It's the jazz musician Clark Terry, who talked about um, development as an artist. At first, you imitate, mm -hmm. then you integrate, mm -hmm. and then you innovate. Yeah. So I, th I, I hear you. I mean, you know, I'd say, Daniel, don't. If you're being hard on yourself for that imitation, even early in your career, it sounds like at least the Clark Terry school of thought is, well, that was just a necessary step in your development. And I agree that it was, I think. And I, and as I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with that kind of imitation. Um, yeah. But at some point you do need to integrate and then innovate, you know, and, uh, and I had, it took me a while to get to that, that last step, I think. Um, yeah. And I and I try every day. I still try every day to to do that. But uh, yeah, I think that's well, a great way to that's a great way to express it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you kept at it. I'm glad you wrote. Um, I, this is the only one of your books I've checked out. But I, I will thank you for writing the girl who never made mistakes. I've mentioned it to a few guests because it was fresh in my mind after I'd read it. And, you know, it fits in with the themes of this show um, so perfectly. So that's why I'm saying, you know, like this, this is the official book of the podcast. Like I may start giving this book away to guests um, as a thank you gift. Oh, I, I think it really is a, a very nice, a very nice book. So thank you for that, Mark. My pleasure. My pleasure. And perhaps we'll need to figure out a way for me to sign some books for you or something. So you can, well, I'll, I'll buy a big old box of books from you. I think that would be wonderful. So, um, Mark Pett has been our, our guest again today. Um, the book is, and I really, I hope you'll go and, and buy it, um, whether you have a child to share it with or not, the girl who never made mistakes. Cause, um, it, it, it really made an impact on me and I'm glad, um, especially that we could talk about it here today. And Mark, your your website, I know you have a website as an artist. Uh, I don't have it handy. That's my mistake. It is markpet.com, M-A-R-K-P-E-T-T.com. Uh, I believe authorstrader.com also points there. Okay. But I hope people will go check that out as well. I, I you know, the uh, the syndicated strips, they're still out there on the website. And you can go and click and pick a random one. And from the ones I flipped there, I think your batting average was pretty high. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to be a guest with us here. Thanks, Mark. I enjoyed it.